everybody and welcome back to another episode of Life Reimagined. Last week we showed you the transformation of our land and how we aim to capture as much water as possible through these winter months. This week, carrying on the theme of water, we want to take you through the process of getting a borehole and tell you all about how we just recently got our borehole done. So, stick around. So, to start off, we thought it'd be a good idea to tell you about the current water situation here on the land. We do have some water, we have a well, and we're using this to supply us with water in the caravan. That has been working quite well since we moved here, but towards the end of the summer it did almost dry up and we were getting really worried that one day we were just not going to have any water. So super last minute we got some big tanks delivered, got someone to fill them up with water, and then obviously two or three days later it rained and the well completely filled up again, over, was overflowing. Um, but we are very glad that we have so much water now and it's always good to have a backup of water just in case we need it. So we do have some water, but in the future we want to have a tourism business here. We have 1.6 hectares of land that we want to plant trees and plants on that need watering. So the well is never going to be enough for that. And so there's no way that we were gonna get around getting a borehole at some point. So the first thing that you should do if you're considering getting a borehole is make sure that you're allowed. Before we purchased our land, we went down to the Camara and we talked to them specifically about getting water on our land and found out that it wouldn't be a problem. So we went ahead with the purchase based on that decision. Now things can always change with planning and rules. That's one thing we've definitely learned on this project. Especially in Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what happened with us is that we just, you know, were checking the news one day from while we were still in Germany. And we realized that um, Portugal had decided to stop boreholes being drilled until a new plan of action was given to their water security down here. And now this really worried us because our whole plan relied on having water. We, we, we do uh, collect water, as Hannah mentioned earlier, from other sources, but that was not going to be enough for a secure farm slash accommodation. So the first thing that we did was we contacted every single borehole person and we made sure that the second that they came available, they contacted us to let us know. And every month I asked for an update from them. Now, luckily, uh, we found Agua Rapida 24 um, down here and Brian there was very very helpful and the day that they opened back up for new requests he submitted our proposal um, and we were really quite lucky because the window apparently wasn't open very long for, for new requests to come in. Ours was granted in about three months which took a little bit longer than was expected but what happened there was that uh, um, part of our land hadn't been changed the name with the um, ambiente, the, the water people in control. So we had to go through the process of making sure that the legal documents were all updated with them to let them know that the artisanal well that we're using for the caravan was converted over into our name and then we could register the well here. One question that we've been asked a lot is how much does it cost for a borehole? Um, the process goes like this. Once you agree to a company to come and drill, they'll come out and visit your land and they will tell you whereabouts they think the water is. Yeah, and that step is hilarious because I, I couldn't believe it, but they literally come with two sticks and they walk around and that's how they find the water. It's like in the olden days. I Honestly, I had to laugh so much. Yeah, it just so happened that the place where they thought there was going to be water was at the highest point of the land and it was where a truck could access. So call me a skeptic, but anyway. So they come, they tell you, and they say that we think the water is here and it is 100 metres deep. So they said to us, we think it's 100, but let's do a deposit for 130 metres. So you pay them 50% up front, or at least we did, and then they schedule a time when they're going to come. But as with most things here, 
if they give you a time, double it. Because they want the business, they're trying to be as most positive as possible, optimistic, but quite often things break down, life happens, you know, manana, it ends up taking twice as long as expected. Yeah, so we got in touch with them in July and we're wanting to get that borehole drilled as soon as possible and we were being told next week, next week, next week. Um, but yeah, they were more busy than they expected with all of the uh, new licenses being granted. And then also apparently something was with the machine and kept breaking down and they had to repair it. And yeah, like Jack said. It sank once as well. It sank by accident once. So lots, so lots of things can happen there that, that gets in the way. But just, you know, stay with it. It will get drilled eventually, as yeah. we can testify to. In terms of pricing, um, we got told and what we actually found was that 35 um, euros per square meter before IVA is good for PVC. Um, and PVC is what you want, really. Steel is more expensive, but has to be used in some situations. And that's about 50 to 55 plus IVA. So that's kind of the price range we were looking at and they estimated that we would go, like I said, 100 to 130 meters. So after months of chasing them, last week the trucks just suddenly turned up on our land without us knowing. We were like, who is this? But we're really excited that the borehole was finally getting drilled. And that, from that point onwards, there's really nothing you can do. You can just sit there and wait until they found water and just hope and pray that they find water. So this is what we did. And we weren't sure how long a borehole should take to get drilled. So at the end of day one, we didn't really know if we should be happy or if we should be worried. And then day three happened and we really started getting worried. So we got on the phone and called Brian to see what was happening with the borehole. Um, yeah, it was quite a nervous phone call, wasn't it, Hannah? Yeah, it was. And yeah, then he told us they are at 215 meters and they have found less water than they were expecting to at that point. And we basically had to make the call to either leave it at this or go even further. And we were already twice as, as much as we had expected. So we were like, no, nope, please stop. It will be fine. <laughs> yeah, so at that point, we, we, we thought we were getting 2000 liters. Uh, it turns out after the fact that we're getting a little bit more. But the next big question that was on our minds was, can we use PVC or are we going to have to use steel? Because we've gone a lot deeper than we thought we were going to have to go. So we had to wait a day while they brought up all of the material and they sank the pipes down to see what we were going to get charged for. Yes. And now unfortunately it was steel. So that was a bit crushing. We'd gone from something that we thought was going to be 35 euros uh, for every meter and 80 to 130 meters deep to something that was 215 at 55 plus tax. Yeah, so essentially it's costing us three times what we've expected, which was a bit of a shock at first, to be honest, um, because that's a lot of money. But in hindsight, it is what it is. We had to get a borehole. There was no way around it. We are getting 3, 000, around 3,000 litres per hour, which is good and will be enough to, to feed the resort, to feed the gardens. Um, and yeah, we're just lucky that they even found water because we heard many stories from other people that they drilled three or four holes and they could not find any water. Or as Jack mentioned earlier, the licenses, I think it's not as easy anymore to get a license. So we've been really lucky in a lot of respects and we're just really happy that we found water. Really happy. So one thing we do have to mention though is having the borehole is one part of the puzzle, but then you also have to get water up. Um, we had intended to have a solar pump system thinking that the water was going to be about 100 meters deep. Now that becomes a lot more complicated because once the water is 215 meters deep that is a much bigger pump that is needed to, to get that weight of water up and out of the hole. So now we're working to get um, three phase electrics connected as soon as possible to our piece of land so that we can have a pump um, installed that can power that water up and out of the land and hopefully into the lake. 
we hope to have enough water through natural rainwater this winter to start planting in February. But just in case, I want to make sure that we have enough to supplement there so we don't have to miss a growing season while the lake fills up um, over the next 12 months. So yeah, we will probably be using a little bit of the borehole water if the lake isn't full, um, but that will mean that we can really start contributing to the, the natural environment here in a meaningful way. Yeah, exactly. So this is kind of the, the next step now that the terraces are done and we have the borehole, we need to get the electricity. Um, we're gonna start putting irrigation pipes down, make a plan for irrigation. And then once all of this is connected and we're definitely secure on the water situation, then we can finally start planting, hopefully in February, March next year, start planting trees and start greening the terraces. So one thing that often comes up as well before we go is, should I have a borehole? Is it bad for the environment? Um, and yes, to be honest, in most use cases, we believe it is. Um, yeah. You know, there's too much, you know, again, taking from the common wealth of water uh, and pumping it into, you know, golf courses, avocado farms, vast monocultures, etc., which is then exported out of the region. And, you know, that, that doesn't go back into helping the, the natural habitat. You know, again, we're wary of this uh, and we don't want to take advantage of it. We understand the privilege. What we really want to do is we want to build up the local ecosystem here because once you start building up the local vegetation and changing this uh, dry scrubland uh, into more microclimates, is you can actually start to affect the climate around here and increase the amount of rainfall that falls on the land um, through, through those processes. Yeah, so I think in our case, you know, it is being used in a purposeful way to regenerate the land here. Um, and obviously, even though we are getting a lot of water through our borehole now, we're not just taking as much as we can. We're still being super, super careful. And like Jack mentioned earlier, the lake is the primary source for water for the irrigation. And we're going to use that as much as we can. The borehole is there to supplement that if we need to. Um, and also to supply the uh, tourism resort eventually, which again, we will have uh, recycling, recycling the water, grey water systems to make sure that we really, really limit the amount of water we're taking out. The other piece of the puzzle is drip irrigation. So again, we're not going to be using sprinklers, we're not going to have massive grass fields, we're going to be using uh, embedded drip irrigation systems in the land, again, which will really help reduce the amount of water. We talked earlier on saying the borehole can produce 3,000 litres per hour. This is not something that we're not going to be pumping for 24 hours ever. The idea is here is that in an hour you can get out a, a large amount of water and that's enough for the week. When we're talking about our land, we're looking at something, you know, about five to 10,000 litres per week is what we're hoping, per week. Um, so yeah, so this is a different case and we really, you know, hope to err on that side of uh, of cautious and being respectful of nature. Yeah, and there's so many things you can do like we're already doing with the terraces, capturing water, the type of plants that you're planting. We are planning to only plant um, plants that are from here, that are used to the hot climate, that thrive well in dry, hot climates and not plants that live in a tropical rainforest and need incredible amounts of water. So there's a lot of um, things that you can do to really, really limit um, the amount of water you need. And that's definitely what we're, what we're trying to do. So that's it, folks. That's our video on boreholes. We hope you learned something. Um, if you have any more questions, anything we haven't answered, feel free to leave them in the comments and we will answer them there. Um, but yeah, this has just been our experience of getting a borehole. Yeah. And yeah, maybe it's been helping some of you who are considering to get one too. Oh, I can't wait until it just transforms the land. Yes, Until we'll next. keep you posted on that one. And uh, yeah, we'll be back with another episode soon. <laughs> now time to walk the dog. <laughs> See you soon. <laughs>